Thanks, Edwan. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Huria, I'm PhD student at PISP. Um, so I've been making most of our figures um, throughout this year uh, while we do the molecular epidemiology of SARS-CoV-2. Um, so just a note that all the data that we are going to be using uh, today may not look so easy to generate, but there will be more sessions later on to uh, delve into the analysis um, of and the analysis and the generation of this data. So today uh, you'll have access to the raw to the process data, which we'll use to make the figures. But if at any point you have any questions, we're happy to answer as well. So just the objectives of today uh, will be to use uh, to learn to use data visualization in all specifically to convey scientific findings uh, of SARS CoV of two genomic surveillance uh, in an efficient and pleasing manner. Um, so I'm just showing here two of our main figures in recent papers that we've published. Um, and we really think that the quality of the figures do make a lot of difference, whether it comes to um, conveying the message to the general public, but also to get professional looking publications out um if people are very new to R and or studio and data visualization it may be useful to get started um, on the existing data sets that are present in R. so one of them for example is the one called iris that i'm showing here um it's easy to get to this you just have to install the data sets and ggplot packages. So there are multiple ways to do plots in R. Uh, we'll be using ggplot today. Um, so this data set, as I said, is called iris. It's just a data set of flowers. Um, and to begin uh, a plot, the first thing is always to use this syntax, ggplot, and then inside the brackets, you will specify the data set. So here we're using one that is already preloaded in R. So the iris data set. Uh, and then there is this syntax here, the AES uh, syntax, where it starts with a AES and then you open and close brackets. And within this, you will uh, specify all the parameters of your plot. So here we're sp specifying the x-axis to be this petal length uh, variable in the data set and the y-axis to be the petal width. So anything that has to do with the data set will be included within this AES uh, syntax. Um, and then how to, so if we did this and we ran this line, so to run this line, you just go to the beginning of uh, the, the line here and you click on run in our studio. Um, if you did this, you would just get an empty plot with the axis, with the axis defined. Um, to start then filling this plot, we will use different functions in ggplot to do different types of plots that we wish to view. So here um, we will try first with a simple scatter plot. So for that, we use the function called uh, geom point. Um, so it's the same thing. You do this first line to define your general plot, and then you say which kind of plot you want to do. So you, uh, you will add a geom point function. And if you run this, you would get this scatter plot as I'm showing on the screen. Uh, if we then want to start um, customizing this plot, we can add uh, custom names to the axis uh, and the titles. So we then continue adding to this initial code that we had. So after the geom point, um, line, we will then, then add the function GD title, where in between the co uh, inverted commas here, we will add um, the title that we, we want to see on the screen. Um, just to note that we can add even a next line character so that on the plot, it will show us two lines with the X lab and Y lab functions. In between the codes, again, we can change the labels from what they initially were. Um, they were initially like it was in the data set and we can replace it with custom ones. 
and the theme function will then allow us to start customizing the color and the fonts of these uh, text elements. Um, so both the axis label and the uh, plot title are text elements as opposed to line elements or uh, other types of elements that can be present in the plot. So we'll use the uh, theme and then element text functions. And then you can spe specify the size, the line uh, height, or the line type, or uh, any uh, color, or any sort of formatting that is available. And uh, with this, the main point is that Google is always your friend. So you can, we're here going to show the main basics of how to build these plots, but you can always go back to Google and, for example, if you wanted to change the color or the size of the X axis, you can just look it up and it will be something like uh, axis X element line, and then you would change the size or the color inside. Um, we can also uh, modify this geom point function. Um, to then uh, try to start plotting by category. So here we want to plot by species. And how we do that is we uh, integrate again one of these AES clauses. This is because the species uh, parameter is a variable in the data set. So we need the AES function um, to call on it. Um, so we will say that uh, we, we, we want a different color for each species. That, that is what this uh, means. And then we can choose the shape. And again, you can look up uh, the shapes for ggplot. Here, uh, shape 15 means small squares. And you can choose the size. And then what that will do, because you put the color for species inside the AES um, bracket, you will get then a legend where it will tell you which color was assigned to, uh, to which species. And you can also um, modify these colors. We will see later how. Um, the labs here is just another way to specify the name of the axis. Um, I, there's different ways to do multiple things in our NGGplot. Uh, it's just a matter of preference sometimes. Um, then there are also multiple types of plots. So we've been looking at the scatter plot with a geom point, but like that, there are different functions for each type of plot that you want to make. So for example, geom histogram would give you something uh, like in the first figure here. Geom density would give you a density plot, uh, same with a box plot or a violin plot. And again, with each of these plots, you can specify various parameters within them. Uh, and here also I'm showing how to, instead of um, just running the code and seeing uh, the figure, we can assign the result of this code to a variable P1. So this would be equivalent to saying P1 equals to this plot, this plot. Um, but in R we use the annotation uh, like an arrow here. Uh, and then, so then you can call onto P1 later and view this figure whenever you want in your code. For example, I'm also introducing here the concept of plotting grids. Again, there's multiple ways to do this in R. Um, we will be using here the cow plot function. Um, and if you say plot grid and any, any plot that you've made before in your code that's loaded in your system, you will see them as a grid. Um, and finally, you can very easily change how your plot looks by a different preset themes in R. You can also create your own theme, but the preset ones are very, very useful. Um, so if you remember before, they all looked uh, similar with the gray grid background. And here the theme BW will give you just a white grid. The theme classic will remove any background, but keep the axes. Um, theme void will remove everything. Um, so sometimes that's useful for when you're doing maps and you don't really need an axis. Um, theme dog will give you, as it says, a dog grid background. Um, and finally, for molecular epidemiology, it's very important, as we all know, to plot uh, phylogenetic trees. Um, for that, we'll be using uh, some bioconductor packages called ggtree and tree.io. Uh, tree 
Um, the main function here will be the tree, um, calling the read tree function with, the, with your tree file. So here I'm using a file that's already in the system, but I will show you how to use your own file as well. Um, there are two ways to plot a tree. Either you use a ggplot construction, so you do ggplot tree, and then inside the AES function where before we specified X and Y, there's really no need for that for a tree. Um, so then you can directly, instead of doing ggtree and then geometry function, you can directly do ggtree. Um, and again, the first figure here, I'm showing just a basic plot, how it would look. And like everything in uh, ggplot, you can customize. So we can customize the color, the size, the line type would give you something like that. Of course, that's not very useful, but just to show that it can be customized. Um, and I'm showing with the plot grid again that you can, instead of letting the system choose the layout for you, you can specify the layout. So here I'm saying I want two columns with this function n call, uh, equals two. And lastly, before I move on to looking specifically at the scripts uh, that we've generated for the African analysis, um, I'm just showing how important colors can be in these figures. Um, they really make a big difference because sometimes you want matching colors, sometimes you want contrasting colors. Um, and there's a whole list for ggplot, which you can again just Google and you'll get all the names uh, and you can use the names as they are. Or there are also preset color palettes um, that give you just a nice gradient of colors if that's what you need. Um, so I'm going to move to looking at the scripts specifically, but are there any questions before that? Yeah, just here, Tulio, Rudia. I think that you made us quite excited to see what's coming next. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, let me start sharing the script. So this is an analysis. Uh, Tui, I don't want. To, I don't know if you want to talk about the analysis that we've been doing before I delve into the figures. I, I wouldn't dare to interrupt you. Eh? You are <laughs> fantastically, so you can talk about. <laughs> so this is just as uh, some of some of the people on the call may know an analysis, a Pan-African analysis we've been doing uh, for the genomic surveillance of SARS-CoV-2 in Africa. They have many wonderful collaborators um, all across the continent. Um, so we're taking the liberty here to present those figures just as a training uh, of how to generate them. So I think San has sent you a list of uh, all packages that you, you should have installed and if you want to follow along feel free but you can also just um, see what I'm doing and try later on. So the main thing with R is you have to first load all of these uh, packages or libraries before you start plotting. So it's simple you just do library and the name of the of the package or library and you highlight everything and click run and they should all be loaded into your system. Um, so first, we will try to plot this uh, map that you can see on the screen. We are using here for this uh, a general metadata table, which uh, we can look at it. Um, so it's a sort of data that we can update, obtain from GISAID or if you get, you're curating your own. Um, that's the one we have here focused on Africa with the different strains, the date, uh, the country, the district, um, the clay, the lineage, uh, the originating, submitting labs, uh, etc. Um, so you can, every time you load something, a data into R, you will see here uh, on your screen what they are. And if you click on them, you can always view them. Um, so the first thing I'm doing, I'm just narrowing by region because we just want to plot for Africa. And then I'm assigning to another variable called uh, DF Africa, just so that I don't lose the first one. And then this part is pretty important. I'm just uh, converting the date 
in the table to a format that all can understand. So I just use this function as date. And then what I do here is that I'm breaking down this date into uh, different uh, different types of uh, groupings. So either I am breaking it down by day or by uh, biweekly or by month. Um, and this will allow us to use these different variables to plot anything, uh, whether we want it to be by week or by two weeks or by month. Um, so that's why it's useful here. Um, if anyone has questions, just let me know. I'm assuming some level of uh, all knowledge, um, but this annotation, for example, just says to create another field called days in the data frame Africa, and we are assigning it uh, whatever comes here. Um, so I am then going to want to count the number of uh, sequences per country in this table. So for that, we will use the function count. Uh, this annotation, sorry, this annotation here just means to transform. So we are transforming uh, the DF Africa into a count data frame. So if I run this um, and then I try to view the DF count, you will then have the number of sequences for each country, um, which is very useful for what we're trying to achieve here. Uh, and then I'm just doing a bunch of renaming of variables um, just so that it can match with uh, the map that I will now uh, try to get from R. So R has um, the some libraries, so for example, raster and uh, SP data and Tmap, where it stores a number of raster files, they are called. Um, which uh, you can have the world um, map or, and then you can, so for example, world here, uh, I'm not plotting it, but it has the latitude and longitude for uh, every country and other data like the area or the population or the life expect expectancy, which can be useful if that's what you wanted to plot. But I'm here just narrowing it down to the continent Africa. And uh, I am again renaming the countries so that the countries in the map match exactly the countries in my data frame, um, because as we know, there can be some uh, variation. For example, we are calling it Iswatini, but the map can call it Swaziland, for example. Um, and then I am just joining the map, which here I name Africa to my df count function. I use the left join uh, uh, function for that. Um, and then finally the plot function, we come to the plot function. So if I just did uh, ggplot Africa, I will get just an uh, empty plot without anything. Um, and then uh, let's see if this will work. So I have to just do it from the beginning again. So as you are running your code, you have to keep in mind where you've reached because as you can see here, if I rerun something else, it can overwrite a previous uh, variable, which will then give you trouble. So if I do just ggplot uh, Africa here and I view this panel A function, I'll get uh, an empty plot, but then if I, add all the necessary um, functions to it, I then get the plot that I want, a nicely colored plot colored by the number of sequences where the numbers are labeled. Um, so I can just maybe show if I remove the color. So I'm removing this line by just commenting it with a hash. If I remove the color um, line, it gives me uh, an automatic coloring. So what really this line does is that it assigns this palette, um, this BRBJ, so this is brown green palette to the, the map. Um, and I am also transforming here by log because uh, as you can tell, South Africa has a lot of sequences, whereas maybe Madagascar has very few. So just so that the colors don't look too uniform, I do a log transform. 
And then I specify that I want the empty regions to be white. Um, and if I wanted uh, labeling here, uh, the, the number of breaks and uh, at which number this label should break. Um, I can also remove the labels. Uh, if I didn't want labels, I can remove that. Um, so what the label does is I am telling it to label the count. And again, as you can see, this goes inside the AES function. Um, I'm specifying here an alpha function, which uh, is the transparency. Um, so if I did one, that means it's completely opaque um, and you don't see behind, but since there are some overlap, I wanted some transparency. So that's why it was initially 0 0.5. Um, and then I can spe specify the size and the color also. Uh, and since it's a label uh, attribute, it comes in a box and you can also define how that box looks. So what's the size, what's the line like? You can also remove the line. Um, we can decide to, uh, if we remove this theme here, as I showed you before, this would be useful for maps. If we remove this theme here, you, did, you then get an axis uh, and a background we don't, which we don't really want in a map. So we use the theme to, to just make it look neat. Any questions on the map before we move to the next panel? Yeah, please. I want to ask about uh, if there's any custom maps uh, that we can use for uh, any uh, our uh, data analysis. Yeah, uh, you can use custom maps. So maybe if we have time, I can show you later. But there's a general um, a whole world map as well that you can yourself cut with your own coordinates. Um, or if you know how to create your own raster file, then you could do that. So I don't know, maybe that's why you're asking here. There's an issue, for example, with the border of Morocco. Um, it just kind of looks strange. So we, we then take that to Illustrator and uh, edit it on our own if we're not able to find a map where um, this border looks good. Um, so there's also different kinds of maps, some that are annotated by uh, various features, some that have country names, road networks, and you can also add any of that uh, if you wanted. But um, I don't know how to do everything also, and we're just trying to keep it neat uh, for this one. Any other question? Um, hello, everybody. Hello. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I'm really excited for this wonderful presentation. Um, it's really helpful. So concerning the map, um, I am just around the ring. Um, do you think that um, using, for example, ArcGIS, ArcGIS um, would be better um, presenting maps instead of using R? Or if you you have an idea about um, um, the efficiency of um, R uh, in comparison to ArcGIS, um, what could be your advice about those two? Um, yeah, so ArcGIS is really good at uh, annotating maps. Uh, they may also look better. Um, we just wanted to show here how it could be done with RStudio because I feel like it's simpler. But um, yeah, if, we're, if you're dealing heavily with maps, then it may be good to invest in learning ArcGIS or other specified software. Uh, we just for a moment comment here that RTIS is commercial, so you need a license, whereas R is free. So just something to keep in mind. Yeah, thanks, Edwin. Thank you. Um, so I'll just show you the next um, panel that I want to run, uh, and then we will go through it on how to make it happen. Um, Sorry, there's just something blocking my screen. And... Okay. Um...
So it's just running. So the next panel that we want to plot uh, is this correlation between the number of cases in African countries to the number of sequences generated. And we were interested in seeing whether that kind of correlates as the numbers grew. Um, do we get more sequences? And also because we see there's a high bias in South Africa, we have a lot of sequences, but we then realize that it, it was proportional to the number of cases in the country. So to do that, of course, we need epidemiological data. Um, I get mine from the Our World in Data COVID database. Um, so this is what uh, this data set is here. I again narrow down subset by Africa. And I just picked uh, the last date where we did this analysis just to get the total number of cases. But of course, if you wanted to see a progression of cases, then you wouldn't subset by date here. Um, then again, I'm doing some renaming just to match my different uh, data frames, uh, the country names, for example, or the parameter names, so location instead of country. Uh, and I'm trying to join this DF count that I did for the count of sequences before to the epidemiological data. Uh, and I'm just making sure this transform function here is just making sure that all the uh, numbers are in numeric format and not in character, which can happen sometimes, and then your plot wouldn't scale nicely. Um, then uh, I use this correlation test to get the R value. Um, this is not visualization, this is just uh, statistical computing in, in R. And I see that the correlation is uh, 0 0.91, and we see which type of correlation and all the details of confidence interval here. Um, and coming to the plot function, again, uh, the ggplot uh, call, which specifies the data frame. So here, because I joined the epidemiological data to the DF count uh, data frame, I'm using this one to plot. My x-axis, I want it to be the total number of cases. I'm here dividing by 100,000 just to scale it uh, and not have a, a lot of zeros on my axis. This is just aesthetic, but it really makes the quality of your plot uh, go really high. And I want my uh, y-axis to be the count. Um, I want here to use the classic theme. As we've seen before, it's one with no background, but all the axes are kept. Um, and if I just did this here without the rest, so in R, it's very useful if you highlight a specific section, then you can ignore everything else. You just did run on this here and you viewed panel B you would get uh, again an empty plot because in this section, there's nothing, no uh, data function. Um, and then we, I want to add a line. So this geom smooth means uh, you will add a line of best fit and you specify the methods. Again, all of this, you can look it up on Google as well. There's a lot more methods uh, and you can specify the color. Um, and then you will get a plot with a line. Um, but I, I don't want just a line, I want all the points as well. So I specify a color. This is another example of how to uh, specify color. It's the hexadecimal code. Um, it depends, you could also just write blue here or, or some type of blue. Um, and importantly, when I'm, doing the geom point function, I again have to specify what I want the X and the Y to be, and I have to scale it in the same way as I did with the general data set, otherwise uh, it will look funny. Um, and here you'll see that I added the size inside of the AES function. And that means that the size of the dot, instead of being a set value like two or three or five, will be proportional to the count. Um, to, so therefore, to the number of sequences that it represents for that country. Um, and again, alpha means the transparency. I again set it to 0 0.5. Uh, here's just a label function, uh, again, that I'm 
specifying all the parameters of the uh, labeling box. Um, here I'm doing something very specific where I'm telling it to label the country only if the count of sequences exceeds 400, otherwise no label. Um, this is just because I didn't want all the countries to be labeled even for very small points because it will make the blood really crowded. So those are all uh, small things that improve your plots. Uh, as I've mentioned before, this theme and uh, element text just helps you to modify um, the text size and the label color and style of your plot. So we can increase here, it's all uniform, but in my code, we can increase the size, we can make it bold, we can change the color, um, we can define where the legend will be. Uh, I think the default is on the left, but we can say here a specific position. We can define the legend orientation um, and we can, so now I will just run the whole thing just to show you what I mean. Um, for example, in the legend, we can define the breaks to be not uniform 0, 10, 20, 30, but we can say it to be 10, 100, 1,000, 4,000, or any number that you want to, um, to specify here. And I wanted to annotate this plot by the R value. And I already calculated the R value here. It's in this variable called core. And I could uh, use the core variable here, but I just uh, wrote in, uh, in quotes what the label should be. And here is just a position of where I want uh, the, the label to go on the, on the figure. And I am customizing the labeling just to not, uh, just to make it say sequences and not count. Any questions? Yeah, please. Uh, concern the R equal uh, 0 0.91 and the position uh, in the yeah. figure. And you use here, uh, I think, uh, 1,000 uh, yeah. by 1, yeah. 100. Can you uh, explain us exactly what? Um, so it's just because before I, I didn't scale it. Um, and when I decided to scale it by 100,000, I just added the divide by 100,000 everywhere that used the X, but you could also just use 10 here instead uh, and it wouldn't make a difference. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, then we wanted to kind of see how lineages progressed on the continent over time. Um, so I'll just show you what the plot looks like. Um, and we wanted to highlight by um, the top 20 lineages. So we didn't want to show everything. We wanted to show just the top 20 um, and then have everything else as white. Um, so to do that, uh, you first have to do some data manipulation. Um, so I'm again using here the DF Africa uh, metadata table that I already loaded and that we looked at before. We can look at it again here. And as I told you, there is a column for the pangolin lineage. Um, what we do first is I count it. Um, this is another way to count. If you call it by as data frame, um, then you get the uh, count of lineages, uh, like I'm showing here. Um, it goes on and on. Um, I don't think it will load completely. Uh, and then I order it here by the frequency. Um, and then I only select the top 20. So this will, uh, I know it says tail, but it actually tail means the top. Um, so if I view this data set, here, so you can either view in your console or you can click on the uh, data frame here and you will see it in the panel. Um, so this shows me the top 20 uh, lineages in Africa. I just assigned it to another column called Pangolin Africa, because then when I will merge it to the first data frame here, 
the rest which are not part of the top 20 they will just be uh, na they will be empty cells uh, in the data frame which i can then use to make such a map where only the top 20 will be shown i am defining here a custom made palette because actually most of the palettes they only go up to maybe nine colors or you can find some with a bit more but uh, we needed 20 colors so we tried to make a custom one um, i just went to google and uh, search for the color list and tried to make it nice uh, and contrasting enough um, so that you can see the differences uh, i made uh, different ones and then i was just trying around um, so here i'm merging the first data set to the pangolin count 20 top 20 uh, data frame um, and I, if I view this DF Africa one data set, you will then see that there was a column added um, that is called, it should be at the end, Pangolin Africa. Um, so somewhere, uh, yeah, you will see NAs, which means that this lineage was under top 20. Um, then the plot is just, uh, a bit similar to what we've seen before, but here the specificity is that we're plotting by date. So we have to read the date column by uh, this uh, function here, which will again ensure that it is taken as a date. I'm using here the date three column that I created before, which uh, just denoted, I think the monthly um, breakdown in dates. Um, here I'm trying to do a histogram, so that's why the function looks slightly different. Instead of just using the AES function, I use the mapping equal to AES. So then I don't have to specify a y-axis because the y-axis will be the proportion. Um, and I am specifying this fill variable inside of the AES because it will tell us the color uh, of each uh, lineage. Um, and I use here the function instead of geom point or geom tree that we've seen before, we're using geom bar. And the position fill just means that it gives me the frequency. So it will fill the whole thing up to the top. If I removed this position fill and I instead used um, the same construct without the fill, you'll, de you'll then get the absolute count. Uh, instead of the frequency. Um, the width just depends on which breakdown you're using. So if, I, if I'm using um, day, uh, daily count, then I wouldn't have a width of 10, I would have a smaller width. Uh, again, the theme classic and all the formatting of the plot that we have shown before, the interesting one here is I'm using this scale fill manual. So as you can, as you remember, we've used fill inside of AES. It means that we're trying to color each lineage by a different color. And we are here defining which color we mean. So the manual uh, label means that, that we will assign our own colors. And it, it's this custom palette that I've showed you that I've made before. And I uh, here tell it to name it a specific thing, lineage. Otherwise, it would call it. Um, Bangle in Africa, like the column name was. Yeah. Uh, and again, uh, I'm choosing my own labels for the axes. Um, yeah. Any question? And, and here I'm specifying that the legend should be at the top instead of the left or the bottom or a specific position that I had specified before. So here you can just say top or bottom or left or right. Um, and lastly, this is uh, quite an interesting one. It's kind of a temporal scatter plot. So I need to make this bigger to show you better what it is. Um, so it's still not big enough, but. Um, Can you click so on it, zoom? Sorry? Zoom? Uh, yeah. But. Um, no, you wouldn't see it. It's it switched screen, so you wouldn't see. But I'll later show the final figure. So what we wanted to show here is 
as the months go by, when were sequences sampled in each country? Um, so, so we wanted to kind of show the distribution over time and all the white dots are normal, like sequences of other lineages that are not variants of concern. And we wanted to color the variants of concern um, with bright colors, which you see uh, at the end. So how we do this is um, we use this, this looks quite complicated, but I'll explain. The segment line just um, allows us to create uh these maybe i'll show the figure first so that you can understand what i mean uh, okay can you see here the figure d yes okay so the segment function allows us to create these rectangles that belong just to one country so that we could kind of differentiate between the groupings um, because as you see, there's a lot of dots. And if we didn't have these rectangles on the background, it would make it very confusing. Um, and then a geom point we've already uh, come across before. The only thing that's different here is that I am specifying different geom point functions for different subsets of the data. So I am subsetting the data inside of the function here. So I'm telling it to label to plot points only for uh, data in the DF Africa data set, which belong to the pangolin lineage B11351, because I want to color it a specific way. Uh, and and uh, I use also here the position function, which tells you how much uh, spread you want to have between the different points if they are overlapping. Of course, here there's a lot of overlap. So we want to kind of define this, the, the size uh, through which it can expand when there's an overlap. Uh, the shape, I'm using shape 21, which is a circle with an outline and you can color the inside of it, which is very useful in our case. And the color black just means that the outline is back. black. You can also change the color outline. Uh, and the alpha, as I said before here, it's one. So that means it's not transparent at all. I do the same with all the lineages that I'm interested in. And here, instead of specifying the color inside the function, I will put the fill, but then put the name of the lineage inside codes. That, we, that means that I want to assign a color to this, but I will do so later in the code. So then I do this with the scale fill manual here. And if I didn't use the scale fill manual, it would assign an automatic color to the plot. Um, so just random colors, uh, and it will also call the legend fill. So that's why we use this scale fill manual to specify which color you want and what the name of the uh, category that you just created is. Any question? This may be a lot of information for some of you, but uh, I think once you download the script and the data, it should be easy to run. And then you just have to comment and uncomment some lines and you can see what difference that makes. Um, and it will help you understand what's the use of each line. I think I'm gonna move to figure two or... So here I wanted to show how to plot, uh, how to start plotting trees. Um, so as I've said before, we then need the function ggtree, um, tidytree, and treeio. Um, so here is when I'm reading my own tree file. So this timetree.newic is a file that will be created when you do your phylogenetic analysis. So for example, if you do an next chain build, you can download the tree uh, and you will obtain such a tree file. 
or any other method with which you create your trees. Um, and don't worry, we'll have another session that Edwin is going to lead later on, um, which will explain how to create these tree files. And here I just also want to link this tree file with my metadata table because um, the tree file contains the names of the sequences and the dates, but uh, nothing more than that. So if I want to link with lineage or any or country or anything else, I need to link it with the metadata table. And what is important is that the names of the sequences in the tree exactly match the names in the table. So this is just me reading my data. Uh, and again, I, I am just here creating another custom palette. Um, and this uh, will take a little bit to run, but here what I'm doing is, I'll just start it in the meantime. I'm just using the ggtree function to read my tree file, which I've defined here. I'm specifying the most recent sampling date, and you'll get this when you are running your data set. You will know yourself what the most recent sampling date is, or it will also be in your tree file. Um, and then I'm saying that I'm reading this as a date. I am specifying here the color of my tree, the size of the branches. And I always kind of use this theme tree just so that it looks nice without any axis. Um, because this is a time tree that I'm uh, plotting, I'm also specifying the date how I want the date axis to look. So this is another version of scaling before we looked at scaling by color. So now we're scaling by date. Um, I want the date labels to be months. So that's what the percentage B means. It means months. Um, percentage D for example means days, percentage Y means year. And I want it to show each two months as a label so that's what the date breaks uh, variable does um the theme function again just uh, styles the 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 plot as you want this expand limits one is very important if you have big trees because sometimes with ggplot what happens is that your tree can uh, can extend beyond the plotting area and you kind of get a cut figure so we are kind of telling it to expand the the y-axis which is not labeled here so you kind of have to do trial and error to know which number to put here so that you get a plot that's nicely fitting into the window um, so as you can see here it's finished running we have a phylogenetic tree we want to now annotate this tree and this is where the metadata file comes in we are transforming the P, so the P plot is the one I'm gen I've generated with the tree. We're transforming it to link the metadata. And we're then adding a bunch of stuff. So we first add, we first want to add um, tip points for all sequences that are from Africa. So this is what these two lines are saying. The geom tip point is the function to add points to the tips. Um, and I'm telling it to subset, so, so only consider sequences that come from Africa. So it has linked the tree with the metadata table, so it knows all the information now for the sequences. I want to color these points white. I want them to have a size two. The align is not important for tip points. It's more important if you want to label the points, then it would either label it with where the points are or uh, aligned to the right or the left. Um, stroke means the line that outlines this shape, the round shape, how thick I want it to be and which color I want it to be. And just like that, I'm also uh, adding points with, of other colors for sequences that are in Africa and have a specific pango lineage. Um, so this is what this double conditional here means. And I'm specifying specifying specific colors to it. Um, and it's gonna look really nice, I think. <laughs> um, 
So we have successfully here labeled all the points that come from Africa, and we have labeled uh, the ones in color or the variants of concern that we have labeled in different colors. And you will know which uh, color defines which variant of concern because you have labeled them and you can then go on to Illustrator or PowerPoint to label them as you want in your figure. But you could also do that in the code. I just thought it would be too complicated to teach that here. Any question on the tree? So just uh, again, before questions, I want to introduce the GG save function. So you could always save your plots by coming here to export and either save as image or save as PDF. Saving as PDF is very useful because it will save as a vectorized PDF, which, which you can then edit in Illustrator. And also a lot of journals are, ask you for vectorized PDFs because they are completely editable. So this is always very useful, but you can also come here and say GG save, and it would save any plot that's currently uh, the most recent one. You can specify the size. If you wanted to save a plot that's much bigger than this, um, you would then use GG save. Any question on plotting a tree? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. Just wanna ask you uh, how you determine the number of colors in the custom tree. And is there any relation between the number of colors in the custom tree and the number of colors in the panel A? Uh, so how we determine the number of colors is just, um, it just has to do with what we want to show. So here we specifically wanted to show these, um, these lineages because we think they are interesting. But if you just wanted to show the B1351, then you would just have one color. Uh, yeah, 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 just wanted to know how you determine the number of colors in custom three, the function above this function. Oh, oh okay. So how yeah, many colors yeah. do you define here? Uh, yeah, how do you determine the number of colors here? Okay, so that just uh, has uh, to do with how many variables you have. Uh, of course, I didn't use custom three here. I had just defined okay. it uh, oh, okay. because okay. initially before doing this plot, I first oh, showed okay. all the lineages. All right. So all right. to show yeah. all the lineages, I needed at least 20 colors because we wanted to show top 20. Um, but that's, and that was useful to me to locate the, the different clusters. And then we moved on and said, we don't want to show everything. We just want to show the important ones. And so we don't, we didn't use that custom three. So it's okay. just a matter okay. of whether you need 20 colors or 10 colors. So you can basically hash that out, custom three. Yeah, yeah, we can, we could remove it completely. Okay, um, Huria, I think we're running out of time. Uh, perhaps yeah. um, everybody's got access to the scripts and the, the raw data. Perhaps they can go through that uh, on their own. And we can also share some resources on our programming. So maybe the Carpentries tutorials or, or something just to get folks familiar with R a bit. And yeah, I think uh, these two uh, these two kind of figures that I showed had a lot of the important principles, and you can always adapt to anything else that you may need. Um, so yeah, if there are any burning questions, um, you can feel free to ask because I don't think we have time to go over more. But you have access to all of this. If you don't, you can email us, um, and we can help you go through it on your own as well. I yes. hope this was very, yes, sorry. Um, sorry, um, th thanks for the presentation. I think I, I was a little bit late. I'm not sure if it was covered in this um, workshop. I was wondering if you had uh, the same problem uh, with uh, working with this um, GSAID or GSAID, let's say GSAID um, global tree. It has more than 500K and branches and I when I want to parallelize this um, three, um, three draw, drawing it's it is really taking time computationally I was mm -hmm. wondering if you had the same problem 
So yes, so actually R is very computationally expensive. Um, so even this tree, it took a while to run and uh, add one, I think it contains about 10,000, 20, 20,000, 20, yeah. So, uh, and to be honest, I have not even dared to try to do the 400,000 one because I, my mm -hmm. computer is not powerful enough um, and I don't want it to crash. Uh, I don't think R and GG3 are a good option to do the big, big, big trees. Um, there are other, other methods for that, for example, Python uh, Baltic function. Um, yeah, I have never tried to do the 400,000 one with R. Thanks. <laughs> Anything else from anyone? And just to say that any plot that you want to do, you just have to kind of know its name or what it looks like. And you can just search on Google ggplot and the name of this plot um, and you'll get all the information. So I think with this basic kind of outline that we gave today, you'll be able to uh, personalize it to your needs. Okay, thank you, Haria. I think um, that is probably one of the biggest attendance that we've got to, to date. So I think folks is very um, excited about these training webinars um, and for for you for anyone that's that's joined us today or if you joined a little bit too late or um, halfway through we have a recording and we will be forwarding it to everybody as well thank you everyone thanks everyone